Okay, so we are going to go over seven different things that you need to think about before you get into your taxonomy project. Okay, so we're going to talk about these and I'm just going to stick them up over here so you can see them. I'm not going to be sharing my screen just yet uh, because this is really just something to prep us. So the very first thing that we're going to talk about is will this vocabulary be assigned with automation, machine learning, or people? So you can have a combination of all three of those things, by the way. Um, I also want to note that I split automation and machine learning up for a very specific reason. Um, machine learning is just another way of automating something. But when somebody says, I'm going to add machine learning to this, there are certain connotations that come with that. So just be very careful using the words machine learning. Um, automation, I would classify it more as just like very basic if-then statements. So an if-then statement sort of looks like this. Uh, is saying if you see the word kitty in text, add cat as the tag. It's very simple. And those, um, maybe that's all you need. And then people. People are involved in every aspect of, of both of those options, machine learning and automation. But some people don't use automation machine learning at all. They just use human indexers. No shame in doing that. Um, one thing I will say about the um, indexing, I'm going to have a whole video on that, by the way, um, is machines will be 100% consistent, but that also can mean that they're 100% consistently wrong. So just because you're using machine learning, just because you're getting a high um, confidence level, also called F score, doesn't mean it's accurate. The end user really needs to be able to use that indexing to find what they're looking for. So ultimately, that's all you're looking for, whether you're using machine learning or humans. Humans obviously are going to have more nuance to the way they think about things, but they get about 90% accurate because, you know, some people have bad days. Some people just are tired and they're not paying attention when they're doing the indexing that day. So we'll get into all of that in a different video, but when you're starting your taxonomy project, you do need to understand if a machine is going to need to use the labels or the IDs. And the reason for this is you could have conflicts in um, labels that mean the same thing, or you could have a label that is uh, qualified where it will say bank, and then in parentheses, it'll say financial institution. The Library of Congress subject headings tend to do this. They don't do very well in machine learning. Of course, there's ways to get around it, but if you're starting out a taxonomy, you might as well just avoid it. Um, other common things that I know that traditional, like library science does, is um, for events or people, they put dates in the label. Again, that does not do very well with machine learning, so be very careful about that. But that's why you have to think about it when you're making a taxonomy. So the next one we're gonna talk about is it's kind of a twofer here. Is this going to be a visible taxonomy to the user? And do you want your taxonomy to be an open taxonomy? So open taxonomy means that others can use it, reshare it, or you know, riff on it. So there are ways to protect that so that people aren't taking advantage of you with Creative Commons. Um, but just keep in mind, if you make your vocabulary visible to your user, it will also be open. And the reason for that is because if they drill down enough in your vocabulary, will they get every term? Maybe not. Will they get the metadata? Probably not because you're probably not making that visible. So. You know, that stuff, if that's what's important to you, then it's okay. But just keep in mind, um, if somebody can see it, they can then use it. Uh, just sharing a story here that for my first job as a taxonomist, I remember when I went into the interview, I was trying to learn a lot about the, uh, the company. And so what I did is I actually went through their, their e-commerce site and I mapped out their taxonomy based on what I saw on their website. They were very impressed um, when I showed them this on my interview and I did end up getting the job, uh, but it was really funny because the next, you know, however many years I worked there, 
um, they were always very protective and they did not want to share their vocabulary. Meanwhile, <laughs> I had figured it out even though I wasn't an employee um, at the time. So just keep that in mind. Um, it really depends on what in your vocabulary that you really feel or your company really feels is proprietary. Again, terms are usually not proprietary. It's usually the structure and the metadata that's proprietary. So as long as you kind of, you know, have all of that metadata hidden somewhere else, you should be fine. Um, or if you're willing to make it open, all the better. Okay, so the next thing to think about is how are you going to maintain this vocabulary? So the reason that you think about this now, so you're not gonna know all the maintenance. You're, it's too early for that right now. But what you will need to think about is if you are going to be um, building this out using some borrowed um, vocabularies, meaning maybe you used the Library of Congress subject headings or uh, MeSH, or um, Wikidata. If you are getting those with automated ways, like linked data, using an API to basically suck up all of the vocabulary, uh, metadata, and labels that you want, the more you customize your copy, the farther away it gets from the original copy. So there's nothing wrong with that if it's what you want to do and if it's going to fit your use case. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But I like to say this as a cautionary tale because if you go into this thinking, oh yeah, we can maintain this, it's just from Wikidata. We'll just, you know, suck up the rest of Wikidata, um, you know, periodically, we should be fine. If you go into it with that kind of mentality and then you drastically change the structure and the labels and the IDs, you will have a lot of conflicts um, when you go to try to update that data set. Um, now, if you're, you know, not using all the metadata or you're adding different metadata to the actual URI um, or labels of those terms, you should be fine. Again, not saying it's good or bad, it's just something to keep in mind as you're making your taxonomy. Okay, so the next one is your vocabulary going to be used for multiple use cases. So if I look a little different than the last second of the video, it is because I realized when I was editing that the filming had stopped. So let's get back into it. So the next thing that you're going to be thinking about is, is your taxonomy going to be used for multiple resources? And it's okay if it is, but you have to keep that in mind when you're making the taxonomy. In the product world, that usually means browsing versus search. Uh, browsing is usually something on the front end when somebody, pe people can actually see. And then search, of course, can also be visual, but more often it's on the back end. If you are going to be using it for both of those resources, my suggestion is to use top tiers of your vocabulary as your e-commerce or your browse functions, and then have the more specific terminology on the back end and it would all roll up into those categories. So that's my suggestion for you if you are going to use um, your taxonomy for both of those resources. If you're using it for other resources that I'm not describing in this video, put them in the comments below and I will definitely address them. Okay, so the next thing to think about is what systems are going to be in play for this vocabulary. So this is ingestion as well as consumption. This is talking about the ingestion systems that you use to actually create and maintain the taxonomy. So there are plenty of vendors that have tools to help you with this. In fact, I'm gonna have some on the channel, so I'm gonna talk to them, so you might not have to. And those are all good, um, but for the purpose of this video, I am going to be using a free tool called Protege. Protege is not really meant for taxonomy management, but because having a good taxonomy means you have a good eventual ontology and knowledge graph, it's a good place to start if you're going to eventually do those things. The reason you need to keep that in mind when you are creating your taxonomy is because some systems will have rules associated with them. They will have validation checks. Some systems will not allow you to have the same label for different concepts. So a concept is going to be the ID, essentially, that means that thing, whether it's bank, financial institution, or bank, riverbank. 
those are the same label. Some mechanisms will not allow you to use the same label. I'm not in favor of those kind. It should really be functioning off the ID. So that's a good tip for if you are looking for any taxonomy management tools. Um, some of the other things to think about are, uh, will it allow polyhierarchy? Do you have to have the whole schema set up beforehand? Or can you add to it as you go? There are um, different compliances that might be involved in a vocabulary management system. So just keep those in mind as you're developing your taxonomy. Also the ingest and the export. So if you are ingesting things with an API, having a tool that allows you to ingest with an API, that would make it more efficient for you to bring anything in that's involving an API. Um, also making sure that if the tool comes with an export function, that it is exporting into, um, it can use an API to do the export, or you can just download it. I wouldn't recommend wanting to get something that just allows you to download. Um, making something more automated is usually ideal, but again, you need to make sure as you're developing your vocabulary that it can be exported in an efficient manner. The other types of systems that you have to think about are the downstream systems. So what systems are going to be ingesting your data? So these are the consumers. So this would be Salesforce, SharePoint, your web page, um, databases of varying sorts, knowledge graphs um, can ingest some of these things. Um, it really runs the gambit, but you have to make sure that you understand what schema those use and that the schema you're going to use is going to work with that. The data that you have will work with that. If you're using unique IDs, that the um, logic that you're using for those unique IDs is going to make sense for those downstream systems and to make sure there's no conflicts. Remember, you know, bank versus bank. Is it going to understand what the difference between those two things are? So those are things that you have to keep in mind before you get started with your taxonomy. All right. And speaking of compliances, that's something else that you have to think about as you are developing your taxonomy. If you are using something that has to be GDPR compliant or maybe compliant with a certain standard, or maybe you have to uh, com be compliant or um, valid with a certain schema structure or a certain validation structure for with a downstream system. Those are all things that you have to keep in mind as you are doing your taxonomy work. Because if you do hours of work and then you find out at the end they are not valid and you're going to have to go back and change everything and you might actually have to start from scratch that's never a fun situation to be in so make sure that you understand if there's any kind of standards or best practices or compliances of any sort that you have to make sure that you adhere to if you are creating your taxonomy okay and then the very last thing that we're going to talk about in this video is are you going to use your taxonomy for doing any for any internal logic processes? So these would be things like um, recommendation systems, uh, user or customer customization, um, doing auto correct or auto suggest in uh, a search. There are many different applications. You can do things on the back end to curate content or collections of products. All of these things are really where the power lies with taxonomies. But if you're not thinking about using your taxonomy for anything except for tagging, then you might be getting yourself into trouble because you might be using structures or um, different things in the labels themselves, or maybe you're not including certain metadata that will lead you to have a lot of headache down the line. So all of these things are things that you really need to think about before you get started with your taxonomy project. All right, so this was a longer video than I anticipated. So what I think I'm going to do is actually split this into two parts. Uh, so I'm going to stop it here and then we're gonna jump over in the next video into actually creating the taxonomy. So stay tuned for that.